everybody, it's Eric Papenfus. It's Friday, so it must be a bye day. And today, Amanda, we're gonna talk about a recent house call that Kathy and I made just this past week in the Hudson River Valley. Ooh. That's right, we were up in the beautiful part of New York. We went to a home that was deep in the woods and we saw an incredible collection of books all related to concepts of motion and travel and the passage of time. Ooh. Pretty interesting. Now the husband and wife that collected them loved to travel and they had the most amazing spiral staircase. It was like it was out of a uh, English tower. <laughs> it uh, it went up about three stories and all the books were, uh, were aligned on either side of the uh, spiral staircase. We didn't purchase those books yet, but we did purchase a selection of antiquarian books. So here we go, are you ready? Yeah. All right, I promised you books on motion, and let me show you what I mean by that, because we have the ultimate book, uh, Motion. It's an incredible book, Amanda, because this is the book <laughs> that is responsible for the establishment of the motion picture industry in California. That's huh. right, because this is the first book to really feature uh, stop motion photography oh. of a horse. And it was done by a very famous photographer called Edward Moybridge. And let's get to the title page of this book because one of the things you're gonna notice right off the bat is that Moybridge's name is nowhere to be found in the book. And that's because this gentleman, Governor Leland Stanford, yes, the same Stanford that founded uh, Stanford University, basically published this book as a sort of vanity press thing in which he took all the credit for all of Moybridge's work and the work of all his engineers and all the people that uh, he paid to establish um, uh, this book, Horse in Motion. Now, Stanford, in addition to being a robber baron, wealthy industrialist, railroad magnet, um, loved to race horses, uh, particularly liked uh, the harness racing and the, the trotting style, and he made a bet we don't know how much money this uh, bet was for with another gentleman in California that he believed that when a horse trotted, um, at various points in time, all four hooves were off the ground. Mm. The other gentleman said, no way, uh-uh, there's always at least one hoof on the ground. And uh, Moybridge said, I will spare no expense to prove this. And he hired um, uh, hundreds of people and engineers from his railroad and he, and, he, and he hired Moybridge to try and photograph a horse in motion to see if he could win his bet. Now, let me just ask you right away, especially if you're watching at home, <laughs> who do you think was right, Moybridge or the other gentleman? Because the bet is decisively answered in yeah. this book. Um, well, I used to ride horses. I'm pretty uh -huh. sure when you're trotting, it's never all four hooves off the ground. So I okay. think the other. And half. that's what the experts told Stanford. But yeah. Stanford didn't believe that. And that's <laughs> why he hired Moybridge. Now, before we get to the reveal, which will tell you the answer, look at this incredible contraption that uh, Moy Moybridge set up. Now, Moybridge basically set up a series of trip wires all along and a series of cameras that were in this shed. It was a hmm. whole bunch of cameras all decked out there. And as the horse passed by, here we can see this in a different angle in the back of the book, as the horse passed by the cameras, it would trigger these trip wires and they would hit the shutters of the various oh, cameras. Cool. Now, it's not motion pictures in the sense that you have one continuous camera filming multiple shots from the same angle. It's actually still shots from multiple cameras, but when you add the still shots together and then you project them on the wall, you get basically a motion picture. And this is what Moybridge was famous for. Anyhow, back to the front of the book, no mention of Moybridge. And this uh, pretty much uh, irrevocably ended the relationship between Stanford and Moybridge. Mm. Also, The Horse in Motion does not sell very well as a book, shockingly. Um, so uh, it's pretty rare today. It's oh. actually quite valuable. All right, the answer to the question, <laughs> was Moybridge able to capture a horse with all four hooves off the ground? The answer is yes, Amanda, ah. but it's not the way you would think. So here are the various pictures of the horse. Um, all four hooves were off the ground at the moment in which the front legs and the back legs were both underneath the horse, as opposed to like sometimes depicted in the statues when the front legs were out in front and the back right. legs were out in back. Um, which is a pretty uh, impressive thing. Stanford uh, not only wept when he saw the photo, but um, he, uh, he won an undisclosed sum, which now has gone to Stanford University. At any rate, Moybridge um, eventually, uh, even though he doesn't get credit in the book, he moves to Philadelphia and he works with Thomas Aikens and others in Philadelphia and he uses animals 
from the Philadelphia Zoo, including bison and, you know, other things to create a whole series of stop motion uh, animation. And he uses um, uh, a device to project these on the walls, which becomes early motion pictures. What a cool book. Yeah, Wouldn't you say? Cool. A really cool book. All right. The second book we're going to do today, and we'll come back to Moybridge in just a minute, because he is united with one of our other authors um, uh, due to uh, uh, one thing which happens in his past. But the next book we're going to get to is a beautiful English atlas. So I told you this couple liked to travel. They had all sorts of atlases. And the atlases were all pre, um, you know, pre-car, pre-automobile, and they were all from the time of horse and carriage. And uh, this is a beautiful English atlas that would have been um, in a, in a slipcase. This is from 1807. What I like most about it is actually the slipcase hmm. because this is how you would take your atlas on the road with you, huh. right? You didn't have MapQuest or whatever <laughs> else. You didn't have uh, anybody else. So you needed to take your maps yeah. when you were going, I don't know, from, from, uh, from London out into the countryside. And uh, you might take the Laurie and Whittle atlas. Now, Laurie and Whittle bought the maps and that were engraved uh, and would eventually become part of the famous uh, uh, English Ordnance Survey. Um, and uh, they are high quality maps, but they also have interesting things. And you can see parks and roads here. If you look at the key to mm -hmm. the maps, uh, you can see all sorts of interesting things. You can see gentlemen's seats, you can see hills and mountains, you can see parks, you can see rivers. Um, it's a really, really cool thing. Do you have a favorite county in England? If, if not, uh, we we can go to one, but I, I will. I'll tell you, it's every county here. <laughs> I don't know many counties all right, all right. in England. So, um, uh, uh, we're going to go to Middlesex County okay. because at the time that's where London was, and isn't that just beautiful? Here's London. There's the Thames. You've got color for the parks. Um, you can see the various turnpike roads, and uh, among other things, uh, if you're traveling, um, you'll see how the roads connect to the other counties, and uh, it's really it's really just a beautiful, beautiful. Um, series of maps. Um, you can also read about the fairs and markets that are going on. Uh, September 4th, hey, my birthday. Oh, look, it's a it's Stockworth, but that's just for horses and beasts. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, a, hair, a fair for horses. Um, yeah, at any rate, uh, with regard to atlases, Amanda, it's one of those things where, here, I'll just show you, each county is done just absolutely beautifully. Um, uh, there, where the, the maps themselves are actually worth more than the atlas. Um, if the best way to sell this book, and I would never do it, look at me, look at me, I would never do this, would be to take all the maps out and sell them for like $100, sure. you know, a piece. Instead, I'm going to keep this beautiful atlas together in its beautiful slipcase um, that was taken on travels. Yeah. And um, uh, and it's not worth it. It's, it's actually one of the rare instances where the book is not worth the sum of its parts. Huh. Um, we're going to end with a, a really interesting final book, which is considered the pinnacle of American book design at the turn of the century. And it is a book um, by Celia Thaxter called An Island Garden. And uh, what I like about this book is a couple things. I like the cover design, which was done by a designer by the name of Sarah Whitman. Mm -hmm. um, and these uh, flowers literally look like they're springing up from the earth or they're growing or they're in motion. Yeah. It's a beautiful cover design. And then inside the book um, are all these beautiful watercolors mm. um, by Child Hassam, who was a friend of uh, Celia Thaxter, and Celia Thaxter was a poet. And they basically tell the story of the garden um, through the various seasons. So it is about the passage of time. Um, this book is very famous. It has a little bit of um, a poetry by the author, but it's really a prose piece. It's about time, it's about the gardens. Uh, and let's go to the end. This is one of my favorite ones. This is the sunset. Mm. Now, it's about a garden on the Isle of Shoals, which is um, an, uh, a series of islands that are located uh, uh, on the coast of Maine and New Hampshire, right at the at the junction of Maine and New Hampshire. And um, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful thing. It's such a famous book that it was recently uh, reprinted by Houghton Mifflin. And I just wanted to show you one thing, uh, which is, do you see the color? Let's, let's let's just sort of hold that there. Do you see the color in that watercolor? Mm -hmm. Well, um, they, the, the, the book is considered a work of, of art because of the effort that went into the making of the book. But in the reprint, it just doesn't quite do it as much justice, although it looks, it looks pretty good. And, uh, and you can sort of compare the reprint to yeah. the, original, the original book. All right, now I promised you one connection between uh, Celia Thaxter and Edward Moybridge. Well, 
1874, there were two sensational murder trials going on in the United States, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And on the West Coast, it involved Moybridge himself. Oh. Moybridge came home from taking photographs for Stanford one day, um, found that his wife was cheating on him and basically shot uh, the, the, the gentleman that she was having the affair with dead. Um, uh, he was brought up on charges of murder and um, uh, he basically pled insanity. And uh, his lawyers were paid for by Stanford because Stanford didn't want anything harming the bet. This is before he'd proven the bet. So he needed to make sure he didn't go to jail for the rest of his life. It's the first murder trial I know of, Amanda, where a stereo view was used oh, to, no. to help prove that he was insane. <laughs> Look, here's one of Moybridge's stereo views um, of uh, Yosemite. And uh, the court actually argued that's Moybridge. Nobody would be crazy enough <laughs> to walk out on a precipice and get his picture taken for a stereo view, right? Sure. And actually, if you look at, um, this is our box of stereo views here in the, in the sky, we have a bunch of boxes, but it's actually quite a common trope. Uh, people would always be standing, you know, yeah. in reckless uh, things on cliffs or whatnot to give perspective. Oftentimes it was the photographer. All right. Guess what happens to Moybridge? Did that defense work? The jury, um, no, the defense doesn't work. They, they think he's perfectly sane. They just think it was justifiable. And even though the judge says there's no such thing as you can't just kill your, your, your wife's lover, um, in the instructions to the jury, the jury acquits him and says he was fine. And they cheer him. They literally applaud him as he wow. leaves. Talk about the Wild West, right? Yeah. And then Moybridge goes on to do his book and then goes on to fame <laughs> at the, uh, in Pennsylvania. At the same time... In Celia Thaxton's garden, on well, on the uh, on the in the Isle of Shows, uh, in the uh, very strangely named Smutty Nose Island, which was a particular hmm. island there, uh, in a boarding house owned by Thaxter, two boarders were viciously murdered, and uh, a gentleman was brought up on trial. And in order to make sure that that gentleman, this was also another sensational trial, <laughs> uh, faced the news, Celia Thaxter actually wrote one of the first works of true crime in which she described the murders and her reaction to seeing the aftermath of the murders. And that gentleman, uh, the defense did not work. Uh, Thaxter made sure of that and uh, he hmm. went to the gallows. So joined in yeah. sensational murder trials of 1874. I don't think uh, the owners of the book collection had any idea about that, but I <laughs> thought you at home would enjoy those types of connections. All right, we're gonna end with a funny book. The theme is Books in Motion. This one's really for you, Amanda. Oh, it's that good. Oh, good. But what type of book is, um, is better for Books in Motion than a pop-up book? Oh, my gosh. Right? Because the book itself is literally in motion. And what pop-up book is better than the Royal Family wow. pop-up book? Right? I mean, you know, look at that. Oh, oh, oh look at that. Look at that. But, so patriotic. Uh, it's so patriotic. But you know what? I really like. Let's just uh, pretend that that's Harry. Okay? <laughs> and that's Prince Charles. And you can be king. Nope, not quite. Uh, just a little bit out of reach. <laughs> nope, not going to quite make it. It is the Royal Family wow. pop-up book. Vintage now. Look how young they look. Yeah. Oh, what a collectible and what a book in motion. <laughs> well, that does it for Buy Day this week. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll watch next week and every week. Maybe there'll be some more books from this house call next week for more adventures in the world of books.